Good morning, and on behalf of the Exmoor Circuit, can I welcome you to this first webinar of four to be held through Fridays in May. For well over a decade, the Exmoor Society, in partnership with the Exmoor National Park Authority, has put on an annual spring conference. The purpose has been to raise issues of importance to Exmoor's national park status and for the well-being of all. The themes have varied enormously from Exmoor's farming futures, energy Exmoor, Exmoor's rivers and um, valleys, through to natural capital and inspirational Exmoor. The themes have varied, but they've managed to attract keynote speakers, some eminent nationally and internationally in their field of expertise. But because of the pandemic, we have been unable to hold them for the last two years. Therefore, these May webinars are an attempt to keep the spirit of the conferences alive this year. The theme, the darkness revealed, and today we're going to concentrate on wildlife. Please ask questions through the presentations by using your QA button and the speakers will form a panel after all their presentations to answer your questions. I now turn to trustee Nigel Hester, <clears throat> who has masterminded the whole theme and will briefly set the scene and the context of these webinars. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, as these four webinars are based on the theme of nocturnal Exmoor, I just want to spend a few minutes to explain how this theme has arisen. As I'm sure you're aware, Exmoor has got a particularly rich and diverse fauna and flora, influenced by its geology, its topography, and geographical position here on the Southwest Peninsula. It is noted for its bats, supporting 16 of the 17 known breeding species in the UK, its butterflies, including the rare heath and high brown fertilities, and of course, for its many bird species that inhabit the internationally rare habitats of upland heath, blanket bog, and western oak woods, our very own temperate rainforests. Published in 2019, the State of Nature report made it clear that the abundance and distribution of many UK species had declined since 1970, and that this decline has continued throughout the last decade. While it's most deservedly recognised for its wealth of wildlife, it has not completely escaped this national trend in species decline. This has been particularly evident in the uplands where curlew, ring ousel, and merlin have become extinct as breeding birds, despite the fact that some species such as the cuckoo have actually flourished during the same period. In 2011, Exmoor National Park became Europe's first international dark sky reserve in recognition of its low levels of light pollution. Many species, of course, are well adapted to foraging and hunting at night, and so Exmoor's dark skies will no doubt benefit nocturnal insects, birds and mammals. It is against this background that prompted uh, the Society's trustees to develop this project to explore and celebrate the range and abundance of nocturnal wildlife within the National Park, and in addition, importantly, to assess the potential and existing pressures and threats to this often hidden fauna. Due to COVID restrictions, the project start has had to be delayed by more than 12 months, but we feel that the webinars now provide a good opportunity to launch this project, Nocturnal Exmoor. This first webinar has been planned to explore the influence of night on Exmoor's wildlife, but the further three webinars will actually broaden the theme to include the effect of the darkness on people, our culture, and finally, to explore the night sky itself. So to start off, I'm actually delighted to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Fiona Matthews, who is Professor of Environmental Biology at the University of Sussex and Chair of the Mammal Society. Fiona. Thank you, Nigel. Hopefully this will work. Yes, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing what I'm hope you're seeing? Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you. Like 
some of the other speakers in this series, I spend a great deal of my time poking around in the dark and I'm fascinated by the nocturnal wildlife that's all around us. And I think it's um, particularly exciting to be talking to you today because of the status of Exmoor as the world's first dark sky reserve. And in this talk, what I'd like, like to do is why this is so important ecologically. Because in the beginning, of course, the world at night was completely dark. And in fact, the only deviation from the darkness would be the moon. But even the moon is a tiny, there's a tiny fraction of the light that can be produced by single modern street lamps. So, you know, the scale of change that's been undergone over the last 100 years is perhaps one of the most rapid of any environmental change happening across the globe. And yet it's something that most people just seem absolutely unaware of. We're so accustomed to light. We're so accustomed to going outside our houses and being able to see the footpath in front of us or being able to switch on our car headlights that we really just don't stop to think about the scale and the pace of the change. And if we just look at, um, this is a, a map of light pollution. This was um, produced by the uh, CPRE. They do their, their Skywatch annually. You know, and you can see just how fortunate we are um, in the Exmoor area to be actually relatively free of light. But nevertheless, there is still, you know, there's, there's notable pockets um, of light and this is spreading all the time. Okay, if you just look at this, this map, this is flicking between 2002 and 2010. So this is um, an image that's produced based on satellite data. And you can see the scale of the expansion, particularly um, across Eastern Europe. You can see those skies are lighting up, but also changes across Britain and Ireland as well. And so profound is the impact of lighting that you can actually use it to find uh, geographical borders of countries. I'm not sure if, if, the, um, if anybody can take a guess at where this is, but it's actually showing you North and South Korea there, again, based on satellite images. Really quite remarkable, that, that contrast. And as I said, the scale of the lighting is absolutely enormous compared with moonlight or starlight. So if we look just on the Lux scale, which is an indicator of the amount of, of light that's kind of calibrated against what the human eye can see, you can see that whereas the full moon is uh, down here, it, it barely registers on the scale, a residential road is delivering 10 Lux and main roads can be an order of magnitude again. Now, if we think about this long evolutionary history that animals have had of being able to live in darkness at night, it's perhaps no surprise that a very large proportion of animals are actually predominantly nocturnal. So if you take amphibians, most amphibians have most of their activity at night. Similarly, for mammals, um, most, well, about two thirds of all mammals are nocturnal. I think that's something that most people find a surprise because uh, apes are one of the few groups that are diurnal. And of course, we're, we're a great ape. And so we tend to think of the world from our own perspective, which is we're active in the day and therefore everything else must be too. In fact, there's rather few things that are active predominantly in the day. Um, some of the arboreal species are, if you have to jump between branches like a squirrel, for example, it's difficult to do that at night, so they tend to be diurnal. Most other things are nocturnal. A very high proportion of all invertebrate life um, is nocturnal, and it, again, it fascinates me. I've got many uh, very talented colleagues working on invertebrate biology, but almost all of them seem to be working on diurnal species. So, you know, if they're talking about pollinators, they're thinking of bees and butterflies. And I say, but what's going on at night with things like moths or beetles? And the answer is, well, we don't know because nobody's actually bothered looking. And finally, there are, of course, some uh, birds like owls that are nocturnal, but also a lot of birds migrate at night as well. And again, that's an overlooked thing that I'll come to a bit later. 
Okay, so why do people like me get very upset about light and try to get people to switch off their lights all the time? And the reason is that lighting actually completely mucks up the biology of a great many species. If you think about it, other animals have adapted their daily rhythms. So in their case, they're going to start waking up at dusk, they emerge at dusk, they'll spend the night out hunting, doing whatever they're doing, and then they go to bed at dawn, okay? You put light into that equation, they, they don't know what's going on you know is it now is it now daytime if i emerge from this church with those lights outside am i going to get predated by uh kestrel sparrowhawk for example so things like bats are very hardwired to avoid lighting actually it was some dismay uh, with some dismay that only the week before last my local church is now illuminated pretty much like this one uh, every evening until about 11 p.m and again not a single thought clearly have been given to the bats uh, that, that could potentially be living there so anyway this this work that was actually carried out in sweden where um the investigator went back to look at churches. This is Jens Rydell. He went back to look at churches that he'd studied in the 1980s and 90s and compared the numbers of bats that he was finding when he went back later. And the results are pretty stark. So basically, these are um, locations where bats are found. The dark bars are where the bats are actually seen, and the grey bars on, on top are just ones where only the droppings were seen. But basically, you can see the proportion occupied declines very steeply when the uh, churches were lit. And the same thing happens in terms of what proportion are being used for breeding. Okay, so this is a big concern. If you suddenly put light in an area, you can completely alter its ecological function. And this is a real concern when, for example, you have things like you might have a barn here and you might have done a barn conversion and put in all your lovely mitigation to make sure that bats can still continue living there. But if suddenly a load of street lights appear because you've got this urban expansion right next to it, that can completely alter the way in which bats, first of all, emerge and second, can use the landscape for foraging. Okay, so we thought a bit about them uh, actually being put off from using buildings altogether, but also, as I just mentioned, it can alter the way in which they actually come out and hunt and use the landscape. So this was a study um, conducted from Bristol University where street lights were installed along uh, known commuting routes. And the summary of this is on control nights, this is what the bats were doing, the gray bars. This is the number of passes of lesser horseshoe bats, of which there's quite a lot around Exmoor. And on the nights when the hedgerows were lit, you can see that activity just basically fell off a cliff because these animals are very, very light shy. My research group have found very similar things looking at uh, comparing pass rates of bats in darkness, looking at areas where there's spill from household lights, um, security lights on garages, that sort of thing, and street lights, and then you see this pattern of, of steep decline, same for greater horseshoe bats. And if we think about what that's doing on a landscape scale, we've done some work um, putting out bat detectors in, array, in an array around a known roost, the roost is at the red point in the middle, and the blue blobs here are unlit areas and each detector had a close by detector in the light. So here, for example, it's a bit more visible where you've got uh, a yellow blob there. So yellow is a lit um, place and the size of the blob corresponds to the amount of bat activity there. And then the basic take home message is wherever you are, even if you go in quite large distances from the roost, you're getting a lot more activity in the unlit place compared with a place of very similar habitat that has a street light at it. And of course, it's not just bats um, that are affected by light. And moths are well known to be attracted to light. So obviously, people are interested in actually use light to trap a separate way of attracting moths and monitoring them. But I think it's worth reflecting on the changes in moth populations and to what extent that potentially could be attributable to light pollution. So if you look at the, the state of, of Britain's uh, larger moths, what we've got is, okay, some species are increasing over time, so a few of them over here, 
and but a lot of them are decreasing. So a lot of these increases are because of increases in migratory species, and we've got spreads of, of new species to the UK. But the ones that are declining seem to be the more common garden ones. So if you like, they're the ones that are the bread and butter for things that like to eat moths. So things like bats, for example. And if we think of the ecological function of, of moths, um, I was reading that it takes about 10,000 caterpillars, moth caterpillars primarily, to feed a single brood of blue tits. And somebody's obviously done a, a back of the envelope calculation. That's something like 150 trillion caterpillars a year. So, you know, the, the potential ecological impacts across food chains are very wide indeed. And I don't think this is something we're getting a handle on at the moment. People just think, oh, it's just those bat people or those moth people that are worried. But actually, impacts on moths and other species could have really major impacts for our uh, entire ecosystems. OK, so as we know, moths are attracted to light. I mean, people talk about moths to a flame, don't they? And just as a, an aside about our shifting perception of what's normal for insect populations, you might be interested to know that originally lamp lighters were made not only to light the lamps, but also to sweep up the cockchafers and moths that were considered to be a public nuisance that lay dead in piles beneath lamps. And it's almost kind of unthinkable now that you would you would have that amount of insect abundance. That, that is the truth of it. And it's also interesting to reflect that in, in the old days of lamps, it, lamps were an expensive resource. You had to pay somebody to go and, uh, go and light them and then switch them off again. And so lamps were actually only lit on nights of uh, new moon or in the first quarter. They weren't lit during half and full moons because you could see perfectly well at that time using your own eyes. So again, it's that shift in our expectations. Just a little bit more on what happens to moths when you put lights out. This was a, a really nice study which was replicated looking at both small moths and large moths. And the black bar here is, is what's going on in terms of how much feeding the moths were doing under dark conditions. And it was compared with red lights, white lights and green lights. And basically whatever sort of light you put out, moths feed a lot less when there's light in the environment. Another similar study looking at illumination of trees into what happens to winter moths. And this is looking at the numbers of females that were picked up on the trees. And again, you get massively more when you've got uh, darkness. This is both on the side. Um, so each of these lights had the light was shining at the tree and they took samples on both the illuminated side and the reverse side, the side in the shade. OK, but basically, whatever sort of light you put out, you're decreasing the numbers of females caught. And also the proportion of females that are mated go down when there's lit conditions. And that might be partly because gravid females with eggs tend to be flying close to the ground because they're looking for places where they're going to lay their egg and they're quite heavy. Whereas the males are going la 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 la, oh there's a light over there and they're disappearing off over to the light. And we know that lights will differentially uh, attract more males than females. So it's like never the, the males and the males shall meet because the, the male is distracted by the light. And amphibians as well, another group that people tend to forget are affected by light pollution. You might have been on holiday and found amphibians just sitting, particularly in the tropics, just sitting under street lights. And they seem to just kind of get captured in the cone of light. And this is quite an interesting study that exposed, uh, this is common toads, to different amounts of light, 0.1 lux, so this is basically darkness or starlight, 0.1 lux, that's pretty much full moon. Five lux, that's about half the amount on a average residential road. And they were exposed for 12 nights before the breeding period. And then they looked at, then they stopped during the breeding period and then looked at what happened. And basically the upshot is that the fertilization rate was halved in places that are exposed to this really quite low level of artificial lighting. Okay. 
So I just want to spend a few minutes thinking about the different sorts of lights before finishing up with what we can do about it. So I think the first thing to recognise is we see the world through our own visual perception. So human eyes are optimised in a particular way. So our sensitivity to light peaks around here between the green and the blue. Okay, so this is what we see if I give you a band of colours. This is what your dog sees, which is why buying a, a ball painted red, you might as well have bought a brown ball and dog biscuits are coloured for the benefit of owners, not for dogs. Okay, and that's because their spectral sensitivity is different from ours. And this matters because we're radically changing our technologies of lighting. So you might remember the old days of the huge orange street lights, these ones, the low pressure sodium. They actually only produced a really small peak in, in, um, of light around this particular wavelength, which happily didn't really correspond to anything having their eyes with a peak of sensitivity at that same point. So these are probably the best you can do in terms of ecology in minimizing impact. Unfortunately, they've been phased out because there are other disadvantages around them, in particular their energy efficiency. So if you compare with the modern replacements, this is what most roads are still, oops, sorry, it's still a little high pressure sodium. And you can see a much broader spread of wavelengths there. Once you get to things like sports pitch lighting, you get an awful lot of blue. Um, and again, if you're a mother, you will know that you want to put as much blue light as possible in your moth trap to try and attract as many moths as possible, because a lot of moth's eyes are optimised to specifically seeing blue. Halogen lights, these are the sort of things on construction sites, similarly have a very wide range. Xenon in very bright car headlights, high performance cars, absolutely awful. And LEDs, well, LEDs are interesting. You can basically make whatever color of light you want with LEDs. But if you go with the cool white ones, which are, I always call them interrogation room white, and I curse every time I drive through a new development where they've, or they've changed the street lighting and it's suddenly gone to this ghastly bright white. It's ghastly bright white to our perception because it's got all this blue in it. And blue, as we know, and blue, particularly if it tends towards the ultraviolet, is particularly bad. Okay, so this is the, an example of the colour change. So this is old fashioned, well, fairly recent, high pressure sodium, the pinky light, and that's what it looks like if it changes to a white LED. That's what it looks like. This is Milan from the, from the sky when they change to white LED lighting. Okay. So I just want to give you an example of, of where colour matters. So you might be aware that there's an awful lot of migration of birds that happens across the North Sea. These are uh, flight paths here of bird migration routes. And it was noticed that birds were being attracted to um, gas rigs and oil rigs, which are lit. So you can probably almost see them from the moon. And basically, as time went on after the lights are switched on, you get massive numbers of birds circling and often landing completely exhausted on the deck. Okay. And so an experiment was done to see whether this could be modified by playing about with the lighting. Um, so it, it went from this is what it started with through to a China greeny sort of lighting. And the basic upshot was that as you went from white to, to red to green to blue, you had progressively less impact on the birds. So you were getting much less attraction happening. Okay, and you might think, great, happy days, we just turn all the lights blue. The problem is though, that different species have different sorts of light perception. So while blue is great, if you're interested in birds, blue is not so great and green is not so great if you're interested in fish or um, interested in bats because both of those are actually find that color quite attractive. But anyway, it does, I just want to flag really that the, the whole issue of light pollution is actually quite complicated. And I've been involved in doing some work testing uh, red tinged street lights to see if that could be used as an alternative way of managing the problem. And the bottom line is you're better, frankly, switching your light out rather than trying to fiddle with spectral composition. OK. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention is sky glow. So often our skies are very polluted. So this is the orange haze that you often see over large, um, large conurbations that you can see from a distance. 
And obviously Exmoor and the other dark sky, dark sky reserves are particularly valuable because they don't have that reflected light going up into the sky and you can actually see the stars. And that's really important for things like enabling birds and other species to be able to use the stars for navigation. However, interestingly, it also means that when you put in new lights, then the effect of that individual point light can actually be worse in places that are actually very dark than if you're in an area that's already pretty light. So this is comparing um, the uh, attraction to light of leopard moths, males and females in dark skies compared with light polluted skies. And this is some work that we looked at where we looked at putting in street lights um, in these are on A, B and minor roads and the A roads were by and large pretty, pretty well lit already as were the B roads, whereas the minor roads had very, very few lights on them. And what we found is minor roads are super attractive to bats on the dark nights, whereas the other roads really aren't. Most self-respecting bats don't actually want to fly down a dual carriageway or a really heavy road of heavy traffic. But when you add the lights, when you go to the, the white bar here, suddenly the numbers of, of bat passes really declines. So in other words, it means that even in a dark sky area, you really need to be thinking about the impact of those individual lights. It might be, again, somebody's security light that they just haven't really thought about it. And now it's illuminating the next door field or the next door four fields or you know, a light at a junction and those sorts of things. Right. So. I'm going to finish now, I think, about what we're going to do about this. I think the first thing is we can think a lot more creatively about a planning and where we're going to put new development, new roads, new lighting, so it can minimise ecological impacts. Okay, and thinking about things like if you know you're going to have a load of roads here with, with headlights streaming across here, maybe you need to be putting in some sort of physical barrier to actually stop that light trespass into woodland, into adjacent fields and so on. We've also been doing some work of looking at, at, at some modelling work where we're combining data on things like the light and the, the habitat suitability to produce what we're calling resistance layers, which are kind of modeling how, how difficult it is for bats in this case to move through a landscape. And we put all those together to come up with a, a multivariate model. And what that can do, this is actually Barnstable here. Um, the red here shows you the paths which bats uh, are most likely to use. And the black triangles are showing you the locations of the streetlights. I think what you can see really well here is how those streetlights completely sever those uh, favoured routes. And so actually what this can help with is saying, OK, you don't have to take out your entire row of streetlights, but perhaps if you did something about those ones there that are interrupting uh, that particular flight path, then that's a way of managing this situation. OK, and another thing that we can all do is think about what sort of light fittings we actually buy. And it always amazes me that you could go into uh, any shop, you know, you could go into B&Q or Homebase and all those, and you can buy not only light fittings that are, you know, millions of candle power. Why does anybody need that? <laughs> and secondly, you can buy things that are just really, really ill designed. So what is essentially bad is a globe light and often sadly these are the kind of traditional looking lanterns and things like that because the light is just going everywhere you've got your little person down here but most of the light isn't used in a useful way at all it's going up into the sky okay whereas the best is something that's well shielded where the light is going where the person actually needs it so just a few examples of truly awful lighting would be this sort, this sort of thing, where you've got light uh, directed vertically upwards and downwards. It's not really providing any great function there at all. It's also made worse by the fact that it's against a white background. So if you put any light on a white background, again, think about people who go out moss trapping. You know, often we use a white sheet or something like that, don't we? Because it helps uh, to attract the insects. We just don't want to see those. Similarly, Illumination of trees for architectural effect, um, deeply worrying. 
there's also just a, a whole load of random sort of light fittings. This was, I just happened to be picking up my children one night from a sports pitch and I started to think how mad the lighting was there. You can see this piece of this light fitting there. Most of the light is going upwards. It's not going where you want it to be at all. Similarly, you've got lights here that are sending the light directly outwards. There's steps here that were actually really badly illuminated. And also don't necessarily low level lighting means that it's, it's better because a lot of bollard lighting is actually really poorly directed. It, so it's low in terms of it's not high, but it's not necessarily low impact. So you might be better with a taller structure with very well, um, a very well focused cone of light going where it's needed rather than this low level bollard that's kind of shooting light all over the place and leaving lots of gaps which can then be hazardous for people. I think we also need to think much more about building control and enforcement. There's a real trend for glass buildings and one of the problems with glass is people tend not to use, not to draw their curtains and the glass is also reflective as well so you've got light bouncing all over the place. In this case, it's also reflected in water. So any development that's close to water, whether that's a river or a sea, is also a concern because of that mirror effect. And don't think we don't have to worry about that in Exmoor because we don't have any sky rise blocks. What we do have is a trend for lots of modern architect design buildings with acres and acres of glass. And I can tell you, because I've been involved in some of these sorts of developments and gone back in horror, a year or so later to realize that these windows are completely unshielded at night and the light is just going everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to finish there. And you know, basically my message to you all, if there's one thing you do, it's pull your curtains and switch off your lights. Thank you. Fiona, thank you very much. That was really excellent. Um, gosh, I don't say much in that. Really, really good. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Richard Bradshaw, who's a consultant ecologist uh, specialising in bats, uh, which picks up on Fiona's talk in many ways, uh, and this is also a member of the uh, Somerset Bat Group. So over to you, Richard. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I'm going to Right. Can you see that? Yep. Excellent. So I'm going to um, just give you a whistle-stop tour um, around the bats of Exmoor today, um, much more uh, general than Fiona's excellent talk. Um, right, so Exmoor basically is a landscape of contrast. It has a mosaic of habitats uh, all combined within a relatively small area. Oops. Not quite sure what's happening here. There we go. Um, so we have open moorland, uh, uh, which is combined with steep sided coombs and cleaves. Uh, these are often wooded or scrubbed uh, with rivers or streams linking the moorland to the wider area. Uh, we have uh, extensive deciduous woodland. Uh, in fact, Exmoor is one of the uh, more highly wooded parts of Somerset. Um, and these are also associated uh, frequently, frequently with steep-sided, sheltered, uh, wooded river valleys. Exmoor has an extensive coastline, um, much of which again is wooded with coombs and cleaves extending inland. We have a small area of coastal marsh and also lowland heathland. And typical of Exmoor are these uh, hedge banks, steep sided stone, often stone faced hedge banks, um, which can be managed or unmanaged. On the open moorland, they've often grown out into tree lines, uh, beaches typical of these um, on the higher ground. Uh, and it's a very rural park with numerous small villages, hamlets and farms, uh, traditional vernacular buildings that you can see here. Um, so this combines really to make a habitat that's, that's very good for bats. It offers high quality foraging habitat, uh, wooded river valleys and deciduous woodland, for example. There are abundance of roosting sites, uh, not only in the vernacular buildings, um, 
a lot of the buildings are Victorian or pre-Victorian as well. Uh, we have a lot of mature timber here, uh, trees with associated damage that provide cavities and crevices for um, tree roosting species. And there's good con connectivity about these. I was interested that Fiona spoke, spoke about, spoke about uh, the country lanes. Um, because our country lanes are bordered by these hedge banks, providing they're not lit and they're often unlit, they do provide really good corridors um, for bats that are commuting, but also for foraging. Uh, because they are, they're sheltered, so the bat can go either side of the hedge or actually down the lane itself. So in terms of um, species of bat, um, as Nigel mentioned, the UK has uh, currently has 17 resident and breeding species. Um, and 16 of these have been recorded on Exmoor, uh, 13, at least 13 uh, are known or likely to breed here. So it's a very rich area for bats. Uh, the only exception that we haven't found is in uh, Somerset yet, and certainly not on Exmoor, is the Alcatoe. This was a species that was only very recently discovered um, in Europe, in fact, as a cryptic species. So uh, it closely resembles two other myota species that occur here, Whiskered and Brant's. Um, both of which do occur on, on Exmoor. Um, and it was only really uh, identified, as I say, in, in the UK in, in 2010, although almost certainly it's been here longer, it's probably a resident, and it's woodland specialist, so there's no reason to believe uh, it hasn't occurred here. Um, but because you can't identify it easily from the call, uh, or even when you have the bat in the, the hand, because it resembles uh, these other myota species so closely, uh, it's often necessary to catch them and, and to confirm the identity by taking droppings and then uh, getting those DNA analyzed. So this shows a, um, that's a horseshoe flying inside a rufoid. Uh, and this is one of the interesting features about bats in, in general, um, is that they're the only mammal with powered flight. Um, bats are actually uh, incredibly successful group of animals. Uh, there are uh, well over 1400 species throughout the world, um, almost a quarter of the world's mammal species. Um, power of flight certainly um, is one of the factors that, is, that has helped with their success. Uh, so the wings are formed basically from the elongated finger bones with a very thin, flexible and strong wing uh, membrane stretch between these. Uh, in addition to power flight, uh, they're the only terrestrial mammal that can use echolocation. Um, and this is echolocation is basically high frequency sound pulses, which are generated by the larynx, the voice box, and emitted through the mouth or the nose. Um, and it allows that to build up a, a picture, a sound picture of its surroundings. And if you have a bat detector and you tune it to the right frequency, uh, this is what you'll hear. So each of these notes is a wave of sound that is sent out, hits an object, in this case an insect, bounces back to the bat, and it can determine with some accuracy how long, how, how far away that insect is, how large it is. Um, and so the event, they essentially use echolocation to, to both navigate and to, to find prey. The other characteristic feature of bats is that they hibernate in the winter periods. So um, <clears throat> bats can go into torpor and hibernation and this allows them to uh, occupy areas that are otherwise unsuitable, for example, um, because they have a very seasonal food supply. So torpor is essentially controlled lowering of the body temperature uh, accompanied by reduced breathing rates and heart rate. And hibernation um, <clears throat> is essentially prolonged periods of deep torpor. Uh, these lesser horseshoe bats here are roosting in a tunnel. Um, and like all bat species, they will periodically rouse throughout the, the winter uh, to feed um, or to drink, or sometimes just to excrete metabolic products. Uh, horseshoe bats amongst our, our bats um, are actually quite active during the winter. And they frequently wake up and move position within the roost to sort of find the, the ideal uh, temperature and relative humidity conditions.
um, it's energetically costly for them to, to um, rouse from hibernation. <clears throat> and so disturbance of hibernating bats um, can be a real issue if they're low on food reserves uh, and they're burning up those, um, those fat reserves essentially to, to wake up. This can be the difference between an animal surviving hibernation uh, or, or not, particularly if, if we have a prolonged, um, prolonged winter or, or conversely a milder winter where periodically they, they wake up and look for food but can't forage because it's, it's too cold and wet for insect activity. Um, so just uh, as an aside, actually, before I start talking about pipistrels, um, another characteristic of bats is that they're very long lived. Um, if I go back to the horseshoes, um, this is tied in with hibernation because it used to be thought that uh, the reason they were unusually long lived for their body size was a, was a function of um, hibernation. But in fact, uh, it doesn't actually explain um, the longevity of these species because um, bats that don't hibernate, for example, fruit bats, uh, are also very long lived. Um, so bats are unusual in that they're very small mammals um, that actually have the life history strategy of a much larger mammal. They have a low reproductive rate. They only produce in the UK at least one pup every year. Uh, they don't breed in every year, um, but they're very long lived. Uh, so it's thought that their low fecundity may be a consequence of flight because it's so energetically costly. Uh, they can only produce relatively small numbers of young at a time. Um, and this would explain why they live so long, but it wouldn't actually explain how they achieve this process. Uh, so, put, so put this in context, a house, mice which, house mouse which weighs about 22 grams will only live for about three years. These lesser horseshoe here um, weigh no more than nine grams, uh, but they can live for up to 18 years. Uh, that's a record from the species at the moment. Uh, greater horseshoe bats, uh, which are one of our largest species, still only weigh 34 grams. They can live for up to 31 years. And as far as I know, the record is still held by a Siberian brants, although this may have changed, um, uh, which was recorded as being 41 years old. A lot of this data comes from ringing studies uh, and repeat captures of bats. So what bats are you most likely to counter on Exmoor? Uh, the ones that roost in buildings uh, are the frequently the ones that people most often come across. Uh, we have two species uh, breeding on Exmoor, common soprano pipstrel. We do record an enthusiast uh, pipstrel, which is a much rarer species. Uh, although I don't know of any colonies um, on Exmoor, it tends to be uh, found uh, in North Somerset more commonly. Um, Pipistrels can use buildings without leaving any evidence of their presence. They tend not to use roof voids. They tend to use little cavities like the one indicated here. You've got a gap between the, the roof tiles and the edge of the roof and the slide in, in, in between that small gap. If you can get a couple of fingers into that gap, a bat can get into there and they'll sit on the wall top uh, or they'll move into the batting cavities between the, the tiles and slates or the felt um, and you won't even know they're there. Unlike rodents, they, they don't chew wiring, they don't cause damage, they don't make nests, they do leave droppings behind. Um, so with small numbers of bats this is not usually an issue. Um, however, Some roosts are very large. Um, soprano pipistrels can roost, roost sizes can reach several hundred or even thousand plus bats. Uh, this is the largest colony I've come across um, anywhere, but particularly on Exmoor, I know there are probably larger colonies elsewhere. And what you can see here, the, roofs, the uh, roof slates have been taken off this roof. And these are actually bat droppings. The colony at its largest size numbers at least 640 bats. They're quite hard to count coming out because they, when they emerge in the evening, they tend to fly back up to the roost entrance and away again, so you're double counting them all the time. Uh, but we counted at least uh, 640 bats in this maternity colony. So maternity roost is a roost that's used by mothers and pups. Uh, they, collect, they collect their mothers will get together uh, in May, 
uh, late April, May, um, and they'll find a roof site, they'll get together, they'll gestate their pups there, give birth to their pups there, nurse their pups until the pups are independent, and then they disperse. Um, so obviously when you have a very large colony like this, leaving uh, masses amounts of droppings, uh, it can be problematic. In this case, it was uh, the urine was coming through to the plaster and staining the ceiling. Uh, so in this particular case, we, we dealt with it by lining the batten cavities here with felt. So the felt extended over the rafters um, and then down into the batten cavity and over the next rafter. So we, we kind of formed a, a seal between the bats and the, and the ceiling underneath. Uh, so they can live quite happily on top of the felt. Um, we left the roof open at the edge. And so the droppings rather than collecting um, here as shown, will actually just fall out of the, out of the roof and onto a lead valley and where they will break down and disintegrate and the much smaller amount of remains can just be washed away by the rain. Uh, another common bat that people come across um, because they do use uh, roof voids are long-eared bats. Uh, we have both species on Exmoor. Uh, the brown long-eared bat is, is very common. The gray long-eared bat uh, is much rarer um, species and um, in fact is uh, endangered in the UK. Um, you can see from this picture how they get the name from. They have extraordinary long ears. Uh, you can also see the detail of the, the wing very well with these very long finger bones. Um, so these animals have large ears because they uh, hunt by hearing. Um, they do use calls. The calls are very quiet, um, but they'll actually fly around a shrub and listen for the prey for spiders and, and small insects and just uh, glean them off the, the leaves. Uh, brown long eared bats tend to feed around woodland and woodland edge, but they do like to roost in buildings. Um, and they will also use buildings for breeding. So, here, this is a typical site of a brown long eared maternity colony squashed up uh, against the ridge timber. There, there are probably about half a dozen bats there. Um, sorry, there are probably about a dozen bats there, actually. Um, all you can see is a, a tangle of fur and, and ears. Um, because you have such long ears, actually, the, the bat on the right hand side, uh, you can't actually see its ears. It's tucked its ears behind its wings, which they often do when they roost. And so these little protuberances sticking up here are actually not the ears. They're, they're called the tragus. And the tragus is a piece of skin in front of the ear canal, um, which we have in a much reduced form which helps to direct the sound into the ear. And it's very important for navigation and locating prey. Um, and also the shape and size of the tragus is one of the key um, features we use when identifying species. So as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the general breeding cycle is that the, the females will uh, gather in their maternity roots in May, have the pups in June, the pups are born naked, they fur up very quickly and they can actually start to fly within about three weeks, and they're weaned after about six weeks, so a very quick breeding cycle. Uh, unlike the pipistrelles, you, you tend to find a lot of males in brown long-eared long colonies. Um, so gray long-eared bats, much rarer. <clears throat> there is a breeding colony, or there used to be a breeding colony in Dunster Stables, the uh, National Trust uh, property. Uh, we, we don't know what the status of the roost is at, at present. It seems to have declined. Um, one of the factors that probably affects the distribution and success of gray long-eared bats is that their favored feeding habitat is unimproved uh, grassland and meadows have declined by a huge amount, 97% over the past uh, few years um, or past sort of several decades. Um, so these animals probably actually, you know, struggle to find decent foraging habitat in a, in a lot of areas. Interestingly, though, um, recently in the last couple of years, doing some surveys for the Honeycutt uh, National Trust Honeycutt Estate, which is west of Dunster, uh, we did actually come across grey long-eared bats. The first time they've been uh, identified actually roosting in a building um, on the estate or in a building that's suitable for roosting. 
uh, you can see the back here is much grayer. It's, it's quite distinctively colored um, compared to the brown long-eared bats. Um, actually, color is not a, although this is kind of very typical uh, morph of gray long-eared bats, the color is not a very reliable way of identifying them. So we did take droppings and had them DNA analyzed. Um, hopefully, uh, Jack Civita, will, who's be talking about beavers, will also fill us in on a bit of the um, habitat enhancement work that the National Trust is doing on their Honeycutt estate. Um, and I think some of this will probably favor gray long ears, so it'd be very interesting to monitor the situation. Uh, another co common species um, that people frequently come across uh, are the uh, greater horseshoe and national horseshoe bats. Um, these are actually a bit of a success story. Uh, the numbers have increased um, over the last few years. Uh, their range and the population size seems to be increasing, uh, largely because of uh, protective measures uh, that have been put in place. Um, all, all UK bats and their roosts are protected, and uh, the roosts are protected um, whether the bats are present or not. The reason for that is uh, bat species um, don't tend to use a single roost. They tend to use, have a number of different roosts that they move around uh, according to the time of year, the reproductive status and the prevailing weather conditions. Uh, the small animals, they lose heat very readily, so they need to find uh, environmental conditions uh, that are suitable for their, the stage of the life cycle. Um, so horseshoe bats are unusual in that they emit most sound generally through their nose rather than through their mouth. And because of this, they produce a sound that is very distinctive and unique amongst bats. So there's this kind of warbling sound. It sounds a bit like clangers or, or aliens. Um, the roost in large buildings, uh, because unlike other bats, they don't use crevices. Uh, they have to fly into roosts. And so you tend to find them in, in barns or, or um, houses with large lofts where there's actually a sizable entrance that they can fly into. Uh, and they hibernate in cellars. Um, tunnels, mines, sea caves, again, other structures that allow them to, to fly inside. Um, so the greater horseshoe on the, on the left here um, is one of our largest species with a wingspan that can go up to, to 40 centimeters. Conversely, the uh, lesser horseshoe on the, um, on the right, sorry, the greater horseshoe on the left, lesser horseshoe on the right, is one of our smallest species with a wingspan of uh, 250 centimeters. Um, and this difference in size reflects the kind of prey they take. So a great horseshoe can take quite large beetles, such as chafers and dung beetles. Uh, lesser horseshoe tends to take much smaller insects, a variety of insects, but uh, midges and other flies, small moths, uh, small wasps, spiders, that sort of thing. So bats that are less obvious, but are, oops, I don't think I need to hear the horseshoes again, but are equally characteristic of Exmoor, and kind of a sort of uh, specialist of Exmoor in a way, are these noctil. Um, these are our largest bat species. Um, I've been told that one way you can sort of size bats is if you lay them across the palm of your hand and noctil you can see are a four finger bat. So the little pipistrels and the um, lesser horseshoe bats would sit across two fingers and uh, the long-eared bats would probably cover about three fingers just to give you a, a relative indication of size. Being large bats, they can take uh, large prey items, as you can see from these teeth. They would have no problems with sizable um, beetles at all. Uh, they have a very low and loud call, and children um, can sometimes hear them because the call falls within the range of our hearing. Their calls are uh, below um, 20 kilohertz often, which was within the range of human hearing. And you have quite a distinctive chip chop sound. So what you'll hear here is a, is a bat, um, a noctil bat for, foraging. They tend to fly, they have long thing wings, they're fast flying bats, they tend to fly quite high and direct. Um, if you see one, if you see a bat that looks, you think is a bird, and then you realize that bat and it's going in a straight line across the sky quite high up, that's almost certainly a noctil. Um, so this call, here's a, a bat uh, foraging. So I think you hear a feeding buzz, which sounds a bit like a raspberry, and then you hear the very distinctive chip-chop 
call that it makes afterwards. It's quite a jazzy syncopated call, I always think. Um, <clears throat> so these are mainly a tree roosting species. They rarely use buildings. This is why we, we rarely see them. Um, and the maternity colonies um, frequently change roosts. So uh, if they find an ideal tree, they may stick with it, but often the, the colonies will kind of split up and they'll, they'll move around. So another characteristic uh, species of Exmoor, um, certainly found over this side, um, uh, in Horner Wood uh, are barbastels. Um, these have a call that's described uh, like castanets. I don't know whether you agree. So again, it's quite a rhythmic call. Um, these are moth specialists and they are called whispering bats. They have a very quiet call. It can be up to 100 times quieter than other bat species. And the reason they seem to have evolved this is that it enables them to hunt moths uh, that have uh, themselves evolved to hear bat calls and develop defensive strategies to avoid the bats, for example, by folding their wings and dropping out of the sky uh, when they hear a bat coming. Um, so the barbastels um, are kind of stealth feeders in a way. They, they just call very quietly. It does mean that um, an incredibly fast flyer. So I'm not quite sure how they fly, fly so fast without blundering into things, given that the calls are so quiet. Um, but anyway, they seem to get around. Um, they're also tree specialists um, in the sense that they almost always in this country roost in trees. In Europe, actually, often they roost in buildings, but that doesn't seem to be the case over here. Um, and the maternity colonies frequently change roosts, splitting, splitting up into smaller uh, colonies and moving into different trees and then coming back together again, sort of fission fusion uh, behavior. Um, so it tends to be the roost areas that are important for this species rather than the individual trees themselves. So let's move on. Right, so their close association um, with humans has uh, caused problems for bats. There are a lot of factors that can uh, affect bat populations. Uh, some of these are, are major, for example, climate change, uh, which is uh, an ongoing um, issue for wildlife other than, than bats. Um, but because they occupy houses and they come into close contact with us, um, frequently uh, a lot of the issues are, are things that are within our control. Uh, Fiona has spoken about lights and inappropriate uh, lighting around houses. Um, in the top left corner here, you'll see another issue, which is breathable roofing membrane. Uh, so this is a modern membrane that uh, replaces the traditional bituminous felt. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it has a layer of microfilaments sandwiched between the inner and outer layer of the roofing felt. And back claws are just seem to have evolved specifically to pull out these membranes. So you tend to get this fluffing of the felt. Um, and this is is actually in the maternity uh, roost for brown long eards, and this is a bat skeleton, uh, the remains of a bat that's become tangled up in this fluffed membrane uh, and has become trapped and died as a result of that. Um, another issue is loft insulation. So in the, in the top right here, um, loft insulation has uh, two problems. I think if you install it in uh, without knowing how bats access your loft, you can inadvertently block entrances. Um, but interestingly, sheep's wool insulation seems to have the same properties as a uh, breathable roofing membrane. It has long fibers, which are quite tough. And this is a naturalist pup, which has fallen onto the, or flown down onto the sheep's wool insulation and become entangled uh, in the fibers and died. Um, Sometimes, uh, through no fault of our own, bats simply gain access to parts of buildings um, and become trapped. So in the bottom right, we have, uh, unfortunately, a collection of dead pipistrelle pups um, that have managed to get into the inside of a service area in a, in a public loo, um, which 
hasn't been uh, visited for a while. By the time they were discovered, uh, they were either dying or dead. Um, if the emitter alarm calls, they tend to attract other bats in. So the adults uh, in this particular instance could have, uh, may have come down, but could have easily flown away and, and got out of the buildings, but the, the juveniles are not adept enough to do that. Um, another issue is people uh, dealing with uh, insect infestations in their, in their roof space. So here we have a smoke bomb, um, which will kill insects incredibly well, uh, as well as anything else that's in the loft, such as bats. Um, other problems which uh, Fiona has had first-hand experience of are, are the use of sticky traps for, for rodents and uh, fly papers, which uh, catch um, flies. The bats come to investigate and, and get stuck on the paper and uh, can also die. Um, Another issue is cats. Um, a, a fairly recent uh, paper, um, there's been quite a lot of anecdotal evidence about the impact of cats on wildlife and bats, but um, it has been found that they can account for up to a third of bat casualties brought into wildlife rehabilitation centers. Um, so the bats, uh, this is actually uh, a cat that I used to own, now, now long dead. Um, which mainly was lived in the house, hardly went out. Um, I'll say what all cat owners say, I never saw catch anything. Um, we never saw catch anything. The only thing it ever caught was a bat when it was sitting by an open window at night. Uh, the bat flew up to a roost and it just happened to come within full reach. Um, fortunately, we managed to get to the bat before it, it uh, was too badly damaged. Um, so the Bat Conservation Trust recommend that you keep cats in at night, or if you can't do that, or don't want to do that, at least keep them in um, just before sunset until about an hour after sunset, which is the peak emergence time. And um, particularly if you do have a maternity colony of bats in your property, keep your cats in between mid-June to the end of August. This is the time when the bats, young, when the mothers are um, lactating and, and key to the bat survival, and when the young bats are learning to fly and are not very adept and very vulnerable to predation. If you want to find out more about bats, then the Exmoor Society is running a bat walk in Hornerwood uh, on the 8th of September. Um, the Bat Conservation Trust, a really useful source um, of information and advice. Uh, they also uh, run the National Bat Helpline if you have a problem that their information sheets online can't help you with, particularly if you're a householder um, wanting to install loft insulation or to treat timbers, or you have an issue with a grounded bat, um, and they run the National Bat Monitoring Program, uh, whereby um, people go out and monitor roosts or, or do transects and, and count numbers of bats. And this has been quite helpful in contributing to um, knowledge about um, bat populations within the UK. Um, or you could join your local bat group. For example, the Somerset Bat Group, there are several bat groups in Devon. Uh, this is a great way to get out and actually see bats up close, they do bat box checks, they have bat box walks, um, you can raise funds for bats. So if you want to be involved, then I'd def definitely recommend contacting your local bat group. Thanks very much. Liz, thank you very much indeed. Um, we are running a bit late, mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's been really good talk. Um, so I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Jack Siverter, who is a National Trust um, ranger on the Hunnicott Estate, and Jack's been working on the Riverlands project, uh, especially um, with reintroduction of beavers. So over to you, Jack. Thanks, Nigel. Bear with me while I try and share my screen. Can you guys see that yet? We can see it, Jack, and it's not full screen. Ah, bear with me. Sorry about slide, this. Slideshow at the top. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, um, hello. Uh, my name's Jack. Uh, I'm the uh, Riverlands Ranger, as Nigel said. I'll, um, before I kick on with beavers, I'll just um, pick up on what Liz said about the uh, grey long-eared bats and some of the habitat improvement works we've done at Honeycutt. We, um, We've been working quite hard on our, it's really interesting, I didn't realise they were meadow specialists and um, we've been working quite hard on our grassland restoration over the last few years and with um, Selworthy Farm and Horner Farm as well. 
And um, yeah, ho hopefully we will see more of them in the future if, if that's the case, because we've got some big plans to restore in lowland meadows and um, yeah, getting some wildflowers back in the Vale, which would be lovely. So right, back to beavers. Um, so the reason I'm talking about beavers, although this picture is of a beaver swimming around in the day, is that they're generally nocturnal species. Um, they will come out in the summer just before um, sunset, so you can catch them sort of seven, eight o'clock at night swimming around in their ponds. Um, yeah, so uh, I've, I've been working for the National Trust for five and a half years now. Um, I'm now on the Riverlands project as the ranger, so I'm practical on the ground looking after the enclosures. Um, and uh, the Riverlands project is aiming to sort of enhance our river corridors and it, it's sort of the, the next step on from the uh, DEFRA flood project, which took, um, Nigel was a part of a few years back. Um, yeah, so I'll skip through. Right, so the story so far. So I'll start a little bit talking about um, the history of beavers. Um, so beavers vanished from the UK approximately 400 years ago. It's a, it's a little bit, we're a little bit unsure of of, <laughs> of the exact dates. There's some brilliant quotes from um, uh, Gerald of Wales, and this was in 1180, where he sort of suggests that the Tavi, as a singular particularity, being the only river in Wales or even England that still has beavers on it. And if that was the case in 1180, I can't, I'd be amazed that they were hanging on until 400 years ago. But we don't have any definite records. Um, so beavers disappeared because we hunted them. We hunted them to extinction and um, we hunted them for food, for fur and that castorium gland. Um, they were a valuable asset. You know, uh, there, was, there was a time in the UK where a beaver was worth 10 times that of a wolf pelt, um, which speaks volumes for how few of them there were. Um, so after much debate and um, sort of assessment, we decided the National Trust decided to bring beavers was back um, to Exmoor. So we did that in January 2020. So there's two pairs of beavers living on Exmoor. Um, and this was the first beaver release that the National Trust has done. I use the word release lightly considering they are still in enclosures. But um, yes, that's really exciting. So beavers as an animal, um, they're mammals. Um, beavers can live for up to 14 years in the wild. I mean, in captivity, they can live much longer, so I'm sure there is exceptions to that rule. Um, adult beavers are adults at about two to three years of age. They can breed from two years, assuming they've had a relatively easy go of it through childhood. Um, they're completely herbivorous, which is a, a shock to some people. People think they eat fish, but they don't. Um, their feeding habits do change throughout the seasons. Their main food in sort of spring and summer, it can be up to 90% terrestrial and aquatic vegetation. So that's literally things like water plants, um, bramble, marsh marigolds, um, water dropware, anything they can get their hands on. They like, like to scrunch things up into little balls and pop them in their mouths, which is quite fun to watch. Um, as we move into the colder months and that vegetation dies back, they start feeding on timber. Um, so this is where their felling activities come in. Um, beavers are, generally speaking, they, they, they favour certain species. So their favourite trees include willow, aspen, poplar. Um, the ones at Honeycutt seem to particularly like young oak trees and holly, which is uh, interesting. It's good to know. Um, so yeah, that's the diet. Um, so the family unit, um, beavers are monogamous. So they pair for life unless they get broken up, one dies or there's a territorial dispute. Um, and the Adults can have one one set of kits per year in April or May. Um, they can have up to four kits, but it's more usual for them to have two. Um, these kits then stay with the family for the next two years. And then at that point, when they become adults, they, they disperse off looking for their own territories. Um, the kits that are sort of post one year old will help to feed the next generation of kits. So it's quite a nice tight knit family unit, um, which makes for quite a successful species really. Um, they're the second largest rodent in the world, which I thought was a pretty interesting fact. It's not something I necessarily knew. Um, and they're also, um, they're a lodge building animal. So they, their home is um, famously a, a mound of sticks and mud. It can just be a hole in a bank if it doesn't, if it's unnecessary for them to build these extravagant buildings. Um, but it's anywhere where they've got access from the water into their lodge and they feel safe from predators. So moving on. So I've got a video here, hopefully it will play, of one of our beavers. This is Yogi. He, he lives in Paddock's Wood. Um, 
he that's my mouse there you go hopefully you can see that So why why have we introduced beavers to the Honeycutt Estate? What was the point? You know, they've been missing for 400 years. Everyone was getting on fine. Um, so the reason we've done that is because these animals are ecosystem engineers. They change their habitat in a way that is, apart from humans, probably um, unparalleled. Um, so it all fits into the National Trust strategy of land, outdoors, and nature, which is about improving our landscapes for nature and people. Um, but beavers enhanced biodiversity these guys famously build dams and the dam building creates uh, wetlands which are, are very difficult to replicate without those animals we can we can block rivers and but we're not there every day working on these structures and maintaining them um <clears throat> the beaver ponds are a so why do they build ponds so the, the ponds allow beavers to feel safe in their environment beavers want access to deep water um, 70 centimeters is sort of the average depth of a beaver pond and at that point they seem to stop trying to raise water levels they feel safe enough and they allow them to escape predators um, the predators i'm talking of were historically bears lynx um, and wolves but uh, young beavers are still vulnerable to things like foxes otters herons and there's even been a few examples in europe of beavers being eaten by pike which I thought was quite <laughs> quite exciting. Um, so not only do these help beavers feel safe from predators, they disappear into the water. They also allow them easier access moving through their environment. They're adapted to this wetland system and they can access their food in a safe way. Um, the reason we want them is not only is, is to create these ponds, is to manage our water in a more natural way. The water, th these ponds become living structures, sediment builds up behind them, um, regeneration of plants and other animals these pools become brilliant spawning areas for fish um, during low flow trout use the pools as refugia because their water levels are quite often maintained at a steady level through the beavers activities um, they also can stabilize and store water to stop flooding um, and they've got um, benefits in terms of our climate as well in terms of carbon capture and other bits and they're a really brilliant way of capturing runoff from farms as well. So our topsoil that's currently disappearing out to sea is, um, can be captured behind these dams, settled out, and we, we don't lose all our soil out to sea, which is brilliant. So I've just got a few videos to show you. This is Yogi again. He's a very busy beaver. Um, the way they build dams is by not only using sticks, but using a huge amount of sediment and mud. And they'll use stones as well where, where mud is in short supply. But this is Yogi just pushing some soil up onto one of his dams to increase the levels. So that's Yogi doing his thing. We'll skip on. Um, Yogi's partner is an animal called Grills, who's had a bit of a rough start. Her mom passed away, unfortunately. We've had her since she was four months old. She's now two years old and is paired off with Yogi. And uh, this is her when she was younger, some daytime footage, which I thought would be quite nice to share. And the final video I've got for you guys is um, from, well, the third of, so four nights ago. And this is um, our other enclosure. This is Bullrush and Lily, who I think have possibly just given birth to kits. And you can see their hole behind them in the bank where their lodge is. Um, and this is some just some grooming. So you can see that they're quite complex animals and um, with quite um, interesting relationships with each other.
And that's all I've got for you guys, unfortunately. So just in summary, you know, what I'm hoping to achieve with the beaver reintroduction is that we create some new habitats that we've been missing from this landscape for a long time. These flooded woodlands the animals can create, which will, it, you get amazing structure through the beaver's felling activity when the trees regenerate and coppice more light in the woodlands which improves the ground flora so you get more interest in aquatic vegetation the ponds and the wetland systems are more diverse and they're larger which supports more invertebrates more amphibians you then get herons and other species moving in it, it's they're great for fish um, you get large because of the amount of invertebrates living in the soils behind the beaver dams you get uh, a rise in trout weight gain and other species like that and the deadwood created by the beavers in terms of the flooding activity where trees have gone from dry land to a flooded environment is brilliant for woodpeckers, owls and bats. So yeah, thank you for listening to my presentation. Jack, thank you very much. That was fascinating and super footage, particularly that recent one. Uh, really, really good. Um, I'm aware that we're running somewhat over time by that quarter now, but um, if um, people are having to stay for a little while longer. We have got a couple of questions for the panel. Um, a couple actually from uh, my colleague, one of the trustees, John Wibley. Uh, John has asked, what work has Ben done, uh, I mean Jack, on the impact of writing regimes on wild bird egg laying? Uh, we also patterns for egg laying poultry. Can anyone answer that one? Sorry, is that was that for is that aimed at Ben in terms of Riverlands, Ben? I assume it is. Impact of lighting. Lighting, no, I imagine that must be actually Fiona. Mm. Yeah. I think I think the short answer is not very much is known. There is a project underway at the moment, I think, from Newcastle University that has a focus on birds, um, because they were recognised as having been largely overlooked in the work that's been done likely to be important though because as we know you know lighting regimes are manipulated commercially um to alter egg, egg laying in poultry so it would be surprising were there no impact thank you Fiona. Uh, the other question uh, is to you jack this one what strategies are envisaged for limiting the beaver as a successful species in the future Sorry, just sorry, just muted myself. <laughs> Apologies. Um, what strategies are envisaged for limiting the beaver as a successful species in future? Error meant being, or being envisaged for limit. Okay. Um, so I think what we're trying to get at is what what's the what strategies limiting the beaver as a successful species? For what I've, as we in terms of limiting, I think you're getting at the the impacts beavers can have on the wider environment. Um, so if beavers were to be released into the catchment, um, I think you've got you've got demonstration sites like the River Otter Trial where and, and Europe, who have been living with beavers really successfully for the last 30, 40 years. Um, it, it does take management. Beavers need you can't just release these animals, let them out into the wider landscape without having a plan. There's um there's a lot of work would have to go into that. You need a catchment strategy to manage the entire river catchment. You can't manage just short sections of river um, landowners need someone to call they need a, a point of contact to make sure that we can we can deal with issues that arise and people you know there are issues that arise from beavers there's a lot of benefits but there is issues in terms of flooding and um potentially you know loss of arable land or or loss of good pasture um i think the techniques in Europe that have been demonstrated are really quite successful. There's lots of simple things you can do. If, if you're worried about trees being felled, you can you can manage those trees, you can protect them. Very simple things like painting on, effectively you can put sandpaper around the bottom of trees and that just stops beavers chewing them, they're not interested. Um, you can also do things like maintain the water levels behind beaver dams with pipes. They call them beaver deceivers, which I think is quite a nice, a nice term. Um, and I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of people now in the UK that are, are getting on top of this and I, I'm hope, hopeful that it can be managed successfully with the right planning, but there's, there's a long way to go before beavers are running around Exmoor. So. Excellent. Thank you, Jack. Um, we haven't got any more questions um, posed by the public. And I, as I'm aware, we are running over. Um, can I personally thank 
all of you for being really good speeches this morning. Really enjoyed it. Rachel, can I pass over to you to uh, close the meeting? Thank you. Well, I particularly want to thank our absolutely excellent speakers. I learned so much from you, Fiona, this importance of most mammals foraging at night and the light pollution. But what was super was that you were giving us solutions and how much you're now working um, on planning and where lights are, are put. I'm sure that's something that we can all take and, and work on. And Elizabeth, I had no idea that um, bats were so fascinating. Some of the pictures you showed were, were superb. And Jack, thank you enormously for the videos. I think were particularly exciting to actually see them, as well as the general information on how you're managing, managing this very important project. And finally, I need to just remind you of next week's webinar, same time, and it should be very different and exciting. It is called Night and Day. There will be a little bit more um, interesting on bird migration, but also we are going to hear about night on the farm and uh, night through um, history. And we might learn some quite exciting things uh, about that as well. And can I thank particularly Nigel again for putting all this together and to our our administrator, Anne Parham, who was so brave to help us experiment with this first attempt at doing a, a, a webinar. And it is with great relief that it's worked. Thank you. And see you next week. <laughs> Thank you all.